before I start, can I just say how grateful, can I just turn on my microphone? Let me do that again. Can I just say how grateful I am for all of you present here today and all of you present on Zoom? Um, for those of you who maybe are the first time here or maybe you've come in for a while, I think you get to sense that this congregation is back, that it is um, reconstituted itself, as we do every Sunday, but over the last few years, it's been challenging. And looking out at all these lovely, beautiful faces today, it warms my heart to see all of you, and I'm grateful for your presence. So a couple of weeks ago, I stepped off a red line metro train at Union Station, Washington, D.C., and I began to flow with the crowds headed to the Amtrak gates. I wasn't in a particular hurry. I had plenty of time before my train would leave. Stepping to the side as a couple of folks who were in a hurry <laughs> dashed up the escalator I realized I was hungry. And for whatever reason, I don't know about you, but for whatever reason, when I realize I'm hungry, it's always a surprise. <laughs> it's like one second, everything's fine. All of a sudden, I'm like, wait. I'm hungry. 53 years, and I'm still like, whoa, where'd that come from? Whenever I become aware of my stomach's growling, that empty, depleted feeling, it seems to come on so suddenly, or at least my awareness does. Anyway, when it hits, my first reaction is, why am I hungry? Which is kind of a dumb question. But anyway, I ask it. As if I have no right to be hungry. Or perhaps I doubt that those hunger signals are really telling me the truth. Maybe what I really am is getting sick. Sometimes feels like hunger. Or maybe I'm tired. That can sometimes feel like hunger. So as I walked towards the exit turnstile, I reviewed my food consumption for the day to make sure if I was really hungry. Breakfast, check. Blueberries, oatmeal, eggs, I remember it. Coffee. It's easy to remember. I have the same thing every day. <laughs> but at the time, I'm like, well, that was like 12, 13 hours ago. Hmm. Lunch. Hmm. Lunch. That's it. I miss lunch. <laughs> Save for a very delightful mint tea mid-afternoon, I hadn't eaten anything in about 13 hours. <laughs> ah, I am hungry. Hunger it is, and it makes sense, and I can fix that before my train boards. And so I picked up a sandwich, a little sandwich wrap out of a cooler of one of the restaurants in the concourse there in Union Station, and found an open seat in the waiting area. Folks arriving and departing, hustling around me. By the way, whose idea was it to put ceramic tile as the floor in the Amtrak station? Because everybody dragging their rollerboards across that. It is so noisy. <laughs> anyway, whatever. So I was sitting there. I had the sandwich box on my lap that I hadn't opened yet. And I opened my phone, of course, because when you're hungry, that's what you should do. But I opened my phone to see if I'd had any messages. I admit I heard him before I actually saw him, although he was only a couple of empty seats down from me. And I hear this voice tentatively saying, excuse me, sir, is that a bite to eat? And I looked up from my digital distractionator, as I now call it, as of 20 minutes ago, and I must have looked very confused. It's a phone, not a bite to eat. He repeated, sorry, but is that a bite to eat? He was looking at the sandwich, 
And then I looked at the sandwich. And I said, yes, it is. Are you hungry? And he mumbled something in the affirmative, but that was kind of apologetic to be as, 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 as if it were to be hungry or possibly unhoused and sleeping in the train station was something to apologize for. I smiled and said, happy to share it with you. And I opened the box and I tore the sandwich in half and gave him half. He thanked me and ate. Now, I, I don't know what made me offer the food, honestly. It's not like I do that often, although it seems like I could do that all the time. But I don't. In the train station, I'm often approached for money, and I always refuse, but really, it's because I don't carry cash anymore. Plus, I was hungry. Remember? That's where this started. I was hungry. And I just spent like $13 (laughs) on a Thai chicken wrap out of a cooler. And I was just handing, handing it over. So I have to tell you a little confession. I, I'm really suspicious of nostalgia. So when anyone tries to claim that life was better back in that amorphous then, I'm pretty wary. Because nostalgia tends to frame out all the ugliness and pain and sorrow of a past and offers only the Eden of our imaginations which is fine as it is, but troublesome when we make some universal claim that it was better back then and we we should return to those values and attitudes that we had back then because then it would be better now, right? So with that caveat, I'm going to make a claim here that is both, for me, both true and probably false. I find us living right now in a graceless age a graceless time. Day after day, I'm confronted with this lack of grace in this world. A lack of grace in myself. A lack of grace in others. And I don't know when this gracelessness began. So when I say today it feels like a graceless world, That may just be nostalgia for something that was never true. Maybe we've always been graceless. But I feel it. I feel it now. I feel it acutely. And as I've been thinking about this sense of gracelessness, I do wonder if I'm I'm indulging in that nostalgia, imagining that this gracelessness is somehow different or worse than it was in the past, that at some point in my or our histories there was some more grace-filled time. If there was such a time, I can't recall it. But this acute sense of gracelessness seems to pervade today. We named our youngest daughter Grace, Grace Elizabeth. But at the time, it wasn't an expectation, a claim on who she would become. She was actually named for her great-grandmothers, two great-grandmothers, opposite sides of, of the family line, both Grace Elizabeth. So she carries that. But I wonder now if her name was a kind of aspiration on our part. (laughs) Or, God forbid, a pressure to live into something. (laughs) I hope it's not that. Anyway, anyway. My daughter Grace works at Starbucks. And nearly every day she returns from her shift with horror stories of customers complaining, berating, yelling at, throwing their drinks at baristas, and hitting on her. Constantly. 
And for those of you who have worked in customer service jobs, you've probably experienced that. Similar gracelessness. And as I sit and I listen to my daughter's stories, I wonder out loud, do these folks remember that all she is doing is serving them coffee? It's just coffee. It, it's coffee. It's a cup of coffee. <laughs> Doesn't... Oh, anyway. Calm down, Dad. <laughs> Another data point. On the way into church this morning, I was listening to a story of a school principal who was one of those incredibly beloved and committed educators, had won principal of the year, not because she had dominated herself, but because her colleagues had. Her teachers loved her, loved her leadership. They said the entire warm culture of the school she created from scratch. Children loved her, and she loved her work, absolutely. Then COVID happens. And she is asked to enforce the countywide pandemic restrictions at her school. And I, as I understood the story, this wasn't a school that shut down. Here, here was the big controversy. If a kid had been exposed to COVID, they were supposed to stay home in quarantine for a couple of, you know, whatever it was, the five days, ten days, whatever, right? That was it. This outraged parents. And the outrage got focused on the principal, who didn't even make the policy. So the parents get angry at her, and they began to leave angry voicemails, and on this radio program they played them. They're horrific. Death threats, death threats to this woman. And halfway through the year, she does the one thing that she never imagined herself ever doing. She laughed. She laughed. The school, she loved the teachers, the students, her storied career, the things she loved so deeply. She was pushed out because we can't seem to conjure any grace for much of anything anymore. When did we become so entitled? Why did we become so angry? When did we decide that the person dedicated to the long work of educating our children, the person selling us a cup of coffee, or the homeless man in the train station was unworthy of our love, unworthy of our grace? When did that happen? Who convinced you? Who convinced you that the guy in the MAGA hat and the trans woman carrying the pride flag were an existential threat and deserved only our scorn. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we've always been that way. Entitled, fearful, tired, angry, lonely, hungry. Not with everyone, of course. Not all the time, of course. I know you all, every single person here and those online can regale me with stories of the grace you've given and the more the grace that you've received in your lives. In the last week or so, I myself have been on the receiving end of some incredibly gracious conversations with many of you, and I am deeply grateful. And perhaps you have even given or received grace here in this community. Maybe. I hope. <laughs> in Christian theology, this always gets me. I don't know why. I'm sort of obsessed with this comment. 
In Christian theology, grace is defined something along the lines of the free, unmerited favor of God manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. I'll read that again. The free, unmerited favor of God manifested in the salvation of sinners and bestowal of blessings. And it's a definition that I find decidedly unhelpful. I'm not entirely sure what all that means. It's one of those descriptions that begs more questions than clarity. So let me start with a simpler idea of grace. Let us simply say that grace is a gift. It's just a gift. It's a gift in that sense of being truly given, meaning no expectation of return, no expectation of reciprocity, no expectation of anything. I just give this. It's not a gift because somebody earned it. It's a gift that comes to us unexpectedly, but most often just when we need it the most. Did you ever notice that? Those moments of grace? They always just show up right when you needed it. It's a gift. Grace is a gift that certainly looks different to different people at different times. It might show up as a simple kindness of a stranger. A smile, a hello, a wave. It might be the first rays of the sunlight after a long night. It may be the laughter of an infant child. It may be that time when somebody said, I love you, just when you felt the most alone. Or maybe they didn't say it. Maybe they just shared some food with you when you were hungry. Or maybe they just gave you time. Maybe they gave you space. Maybe they gave you patience, forgiveness. Maybe the gift of grace is to stop seeing our discomfort as a problem to be solved. Maybe the greatest gift we can offer each other is to set aside our needs, our desires, my needs, my desires, my thoughts and ideas, and problem-solving skills, of which we have plenty, and just let others be. Be who they are. Be where they are. Be who they are becoming. To dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put somebody up up there if just for a few moments. You can climb back up later. I want to return to that encounter that I had a couple weeks ago in Union Station, the one in which I sound like the hero of the story. Make me feel good. Where I gave a guy some food because he asked for it. And perhaps you're thinking, well, of course my minister would do that. That's what ministers do, right? They're preternaturally nice to people. It's their job to be that person, their job to offer grace. And maybe if they do it really well, I won't have to. But here's the thing about grace. I did not I did not conjure grace in that moment. I did not conjure the grace to share that sandwich. It honestly just isn't really my instinctive response. That grace was seated in me long before I sat next to the man asleep in Union Station. Let me back up. When I came off that metro train and realizing I was hungry, I stopped into one of the cafes in the concourse, literally just the first one I saw. It was getting late. 
and it kind of looked like the cafe was shutting down for the day. There wasn't really anybody in there eating and only a couple of employees. One was mopping the floor. So I asked the guy who was mopping the floor if they were still open. He said, yeah, sure, we're still open. And he sort of pointed me over towards the counter. So I'm trying to scan for whatever the menu is above the counter, and there's a woman behind the counter. And she, and she um, informed me that they don't actually take orders at the counter, that I had to grab something out of the cooler. So I turn, and there's this whole long cooler full of packaged sandwiches. Didn't excite me, <laughs> quite honestly. I was like, well, I'm hungry, but uh, this is it. So I'm sitting there staring at this cooler. And the woman around the, at the counter ended up standing right next to me. I, don't even, I didn't even see her come. She just came around and stood next to me. And she said, um, try the Thai chicken wraps. I just made them. And I said, fantastic. I'll have one. And she smiled, this big, bright smile, and then turned to the guy that was pushing the mop around and said, he's going to try the chicken wraps. <laughs> I told him I just made them, and he's going to try them. And I realized in the moment her joy and her pride in her work, I heard in her voice the grace that she wanted to put into the world. The grace that she wanted to put into the world. The unmerited, unexpected gift of hers that manifested in that moment as a Thai chicken wrap. But meant simply so much more than that. Yeah? And against my propensity to seeing the world right now as a particularly graceless place, it was her grace that got seeded into me. She didn't need to come around the corner to offer her best gifts. I didn't require them. I didn't even expect them. She just showed me, she just showed up next to me and offered this manifestation of her love for another, and the seed of grace was cast. And unbeknownst to me, in my highest, and unbeknownst to me, in my hunger, in my distraction, it quickly grew. And all I could do then was share it. I'm not the hero of the story. I'm really not. I'm just a conduit through which a young woman's love towards a stranger manifests itself in a hungry man sharing some food with another hungry man. Grace manifests right there and then in the clatter and clamor of that train station. So friends, friends, today I have a request of all of you, of all of us. Might you, might you too, be the sower of grace in this world. If not the sower, might you recognize the grace offered to you every day and move it on to others. Particularly others who do not need to be held as problems to be solved, but rather as humans merely being in this world, doing the best they can with all they've got just like you are. Because the thing about grace, the thing about grace is it can't be hoarded. It can't be kept to yourself. And it can't be left to others. It's up to us. It turns out, friends, I'm wrong. I am wrong. We're not living in a graceless age. Or at least it doesn't have to be. We have all we need, all we need to fill this world with grace. It starts here. It starts here. It starts with us. It starts with inviting one another to awaken to love. And when we do, we pour that love back into the world. 
Amen, my friends. And I love you. And may we live in blessing.